Hello, my name is Kenneth Opal. I'm going to be reading to you today from my latest book called Hatch. It is the second book in my new Bloom trilogy. In the first book, Bloom, I introduce you to my three main characters, Anaya, Petra, and Seth, who live on Salt Spring Island, and after a huge deluge, strange black plants begin to grow all over the island. There's a tall, spiky, bamboo-like thing that takes over farmers' fields. There's a snaking vine that emits a sleeping gas and sneaks into your house and grows into your nostrils and down your throat. Worst of all is a pit plant that grows underneath the earth and waits patiently for its prey to walk overhead. Maybe a raccoon, maybe a deer, maybe a human. And the prey falls into this huge vegetable sack which seals over and emits these digestive enzymes which basically melt its prey. Now my three main characters, Anaya, Petra, and Seth, are the only people on the island who are immune to these plants. They are not allergic to the pollens they produce, they are not harmed by the acids the pit plants produce. And by now these plants have spread all over the world. No one knows where they've come from or how to get rid of them. But my three main characters attract a lot of interest because people are wondering what's special about these kids? Why are they invincible. And in the course of Bloom, my three main characters learn a great deal about where these plants have come from and they also learn about why they are immune to them. I'm going to start right at the beginning of the second book, Hatch. It's going to be okay. They were rising. They were getting out. Beyond the metal walls of the elevator, Petra heard the rattle and clack of cables pulling them higher. Up, 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 she chanted inside her head. Her heart beat against the cage of her ribs. She stared at the control panel, wishing they could go faster. Sweat prickled her back. The elevator was packed with anxious teenagers, jostling against each other in their color-coded jumpsuits. She did another quick head count. They were all here. No one got left behind, not even Seth. She found him in the crowd, still in his hospital gown. They'd rescued him, just in time. Up, up, up. Soon, the elevator would jolt to a stop. Soon, the doors would open. Soon, they'd be free. Beside Petra, Anaya squeezed her hand. Petra squeezed back. She was so grateful to have her oldest friend in the world with her. It didn't matter that Petra or Anaya looked different now. There was still Anaya, and she, Petra, was still the same, despite everything. I am still me. The thought was like a rope she clung to, like the elevator cable lifting them out of here. If it frayed and snapped, all was lost. It's going to be okay. From deep below came a rusty squeal. The elevator wobbled and Petra touched her hand against the wall. Are we too heavy? She whispered to Anaya. She didn't know why she was whispering. It's a freight elevator, her friend said. We should be fine. Nothing they could do about it now. Anyway, they were still rising and that was all that mattered. Up, up, up. On the control panel, there were only two buttons. The top one was lit, a pale, flickering light beckoning them to the outside. The elevator shuddered and stopped. Petra turned hopefully to Anaya. Are we there? With a frown, her friend shook her head. It's too soon. Too soon? Petra felt like they'd been in here forever. She stared at the doors, willing them to snap open. They didn't. Something's wrong, Anaya said. Are we stuck or something? Frantically, Petra stabbed at the top button, then gasped as the elevator dropped a little. From below came the anguished sounds of metal twisting. It sounded like it was being chewed. She didn't want to think about the kind of teeth that could chew metal. She didn't want to think about what would happen if those teeth chewed right through the elevator cable. Another downward tug. The elevator suddenly seemed a lot smaller, the air thinner. She gulped back the panic blooming through her body. We've got to get out of here, she said, looking at the ceiling. The elevator shuddered violently, and the light blinked out. Two weeks earlier. Chapter 1. This wasn't normal rain. It came as a sudden deluge, pockmarking the water and misting Anaya's view of the battered city across the harbor. It lashed down on the field of Deadman's Island, where she stood with Mom and Dad, Petra and her parents, Seth and Dr. Stephanie Weber. And it wasn't right. Just minutes ago, all her attention had been focused on Stanley Park, where the cryptogenic grass and vines were dying. Yesterday they'd been sprayed with an experimental herbicide, and now they were wilting and cracking. Up till now, nothing had been able to kill these plants. They'd spread worldwide, crowding out crops, 
sending strangling vines into houses, waiting underground to trap and eat animals in their acid-filled sacks. But the herbicide that Dad and Dr. Weber had created, it worked. And seconds ago, Anai had been cheering along with everyone else on the army base who'd rushed out to witness this huge triumph. But then the rain had come. Mostly it was real rain. Anaya could feel it wet against her face, but among the raindrops were ones that were too big to be normal. They didn't soak into the earth, but bounced and settled on the grass like gleaming translucent beads. Hail, Mum said. Her mother was a pilot, and Anaya knew she'd seen all kinds of severe weather. Hail in May was weird, but not impossible. And Anaya wanted it to be hail. But near her feet, one of the gleaming beads quivered, swelled, then burst. She stepped back with a gasp as something swift and wet uncoiled from inside. It happened so quickly that she couldn't tell the thing's size or shape, except that it seemed too big to come from such a tiny space. In a second, it had burrowed into the earth and disappeared. Did you see that? She cried. Eggs, Dad said, kneeling down as more of them hatched. Their squirming cargo slithered into the grass. He lunged and caught something in his cupped hands, but it squirted between his fingers and was gone. Holy crap, said Seth. What are they? There's hundreds of them, Petra gasped, stamping with her foot. Anaya's shoulders jerked at the sound of a gunshot. Across the field, a soldier fired a pistol uselessly at the ground until someone yelled at him to stop. They're everywhere, she heard another soldier shout. We need specimens, Dr. Weber was saying with a remarkable calm. Anaya spotted several more trembling eggs nestled among the blades of grass. She snatched the coffee cup from Petra's father and splashed out the contents. Dropping to her knees, she scooped up the eggs and snapped the plastic lid back on. Good thinking, said Dad. Let's get that to the lab, Dr. Weber said. Fast. As quickly as it had come, the rain subsided. Anaya rushed toward the main building. She felt like she was clutching a grenade. Against the waxed paper was a sudden churning. I think they're hatching. She sped up, bolting through the doors, down the corridor, and into Dr. Weber's laboratory. In here, Dr. Weber told her, opening a large glass terrarium. Anaya lowered the coffee cup inside. Very quickly, she snapped off the lid. Several tiny, translucent creatures spilled out. Dr. Weber sealed the terrarium. Wriggling at the bottom, the things looked like they were trying to burrow through the glass. They all want to get underground, Seth said. They're larvae. Dad remarked, leaning closer, trying to find somewhere safe to grow. And they're not all the same. He turned to Dr. Weber. Stephanie, can you get that magnifying camera working? With the joystick, Dr. Weber angled the small camera mounted above the terrarium. She flipped a switch, and on the monitor loomed some kind of blunt-faced worm. Looks kind of like a borer worm, Anaya said. Growing up with a botanist dad, she'd been shown all sorts of things, not simply weird plants and the freaky creatures that ate them, she knew it pleased Dad that she'd never been one of those kids who squealed at the sight of bugs. He taught her to look longer and closer. Yeah, Dad agreed, a flat-headed borer larva. So th these things are from Earth? Seth asked, hopefully. They just fell from the freaking sky in raindrops, Petra told him. I just want to know for sure, Seth retorted. These definitely aren't from Earth, Dad said. Borer larvae aren't segmented like this. And they don't have lateral fins. He pointed at the long ridges that ran the length of the thing's body. They might be for digging, Dr. Weber remarked. When the worm opened its wide mouth, Anaya took a sharp breath. Oh my God, said Petra. Inside were blades that looked like the turbine of a drilling machine. On the monitor, another creature now plunged into view. This one had an oversized head, which was mostly taken up with a pair of black dot eyes. Its narrow body was like a chain of armored blocks, each sprouting spiky hairs. Below its head was a big hump, and through the translucent flesh, Anaya made out something dark and bundled. What's that? She asked, pointing. I think, Dad remarked, those might be the beginnings of wings. This one might be a flyer. What else have we got in here? Dr. Weber panned the camera across the terrarium. There were a couple more of the bulgy-headed creatures, a few more worms, and then a grub-like thing so blobby, Anaya couldn't tell which end was which. This little dude's a puzzle, Dad remarked as the camera zoomed in. Dad had always had a habit of calling his specimens endearing names. Rascal, scoundrel, smart aleck. He's still completely undifferentiated, Dad said. Meaning? asked Diane Sumner. Petra's mother worked for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and liked to understand things as quickly as possible. Meaning it's hard to tell what the heck it is, replied her husband, Cal. 
who was a nurse practitioner at the Salt Spring Hospital. As Anaya watched, the grub thing flopped over to a worm that was busily bashing its head against the floor. She still couldn't tell which end was which, until the grub thing unhinged its jaws and it inhaled the worm whole. That just really happened, Petra said, sounding horrified. Bloated, the grub was motionless for a few seconds. Maybe stunned, it had eaten something as big as itself. Its body twitched, then it flumped over to one of the black-eyed bugs and ate that, too. It finished off all the other larvae in the terrarium. Its swollen body bulged as if its prey were still alive and thrashing around inside. Then it became very still. Did it die? Anaya heard Mum ask. What's all that goo? Seth said. A pale fluid oozed from the thing's flesh. And at first, Anaya thought it must be injured. But the liquid quickly hardened into an opaque gray coating. Cocoon? She asked, squinting. It's entered the pupil stage, Dad said. Looks more like a shell. Dr. Weber commented, hard. How could it turn itself into an egg? Petra asked, it just hatched. Whatever it is, Dad said, this troublemaker is definitely a work in progress. I don't want to see him when he's finished, said Petra. Dr. Weber! Anaya turned to a lab technician at a nearby workstation, pointing at her monitor. On it was a weather broadcast showing a huge white swirl over the Pacific Ocean. Its eastern edge covered the west coast of North America, including Vancouver. That's one heck of a system, said Mom. It's like that big rain a couple weeks ago, Seth said. In a time-lapse visual, the enormous swirl of cloud expanded, swelling across North America, billowing toward Asia, bellying down to swallow up South America. Except this time the rain is eggs, said Anaya, not seeds. Is this it? asked Petra. Are they invading? They. Anaya stared at the creatures beyond the glass. These aren't them, are they? The cryptogens? That was the name they'd given them. It meant species of unknown origin. Maybe it was more scientific than the word aliens, but it was no less scary. Not a chance, said Dr. Weber, nodding at the terrarium. These things aren't higher order life forms. They're oviparous, egg layers, insects by the looks of it. It's definitely a new invasion, but not the big one. Just another bit of an alien ecosystem, Dad said. First, they sent down the Florida, flora, now we're getting some fauna. Step away from your workstations. Anaya jolted at the booming voice and spun around. Colonel Pearson, the commander of the base, strode into the lab, soldiers fanning out behind him. What's going on? Dr. Weber demanded. He knows, Anaya thought with a clenched heart. Pearson knows what we are. And that's the beginning of Hatch. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for listening.